It's been almost 10 years and I'm still not over Dream Drop Distance's gameplay and level design. KH has always had varied levels, and 3D is no different. To the streets and countrysides of Paris, to amusement parks, to the opera in France, to musical realms, to the digital world, to the countryside of uh, France, again. Man, what is it with Cage in France? 3D continues the series tradition of depicting these movies in fun, inventive ways, especially with this title's emphasis on verticality in its levels. But the real stars of this game, as in the case of many a KH game, are the original worlds. And man, oh man, does 3D have interesting takes on Traverse Town and the world that never was. And while I could talk about how the first three districts of 3D's Traverse Town are an integrated tutorial that allows players to get accustomed to the new mechanics in a familiar setting before dropping them into the flow motion playground that are the back streets in the mailroom to teach them that they can use flow motion to approach level traversal in almost any way they want, while also foreshadowing that the Mark of Mastery exam has gone off the rails in an innovative example of the drop mechanic before giving players control over that mechanic and luring them into a false sense of security that this mechanic would definitely not come back to be used against the player in the final level. <laughs> Instead, I'm going to talk about how 3D foreshadows its endgame through gameplay hints and through level design found in the world that never was. Pleasant dreams, kiddo. Starting off with the level design, just as Traverse Town's level design is closely tied to flow motion, reality shifts are closely tied to the level design of the world that never was, particularly the avenue to dreams of Sora's level and the Walk of Delusions in Riku's. The reality shift for this world has two different names, but essentially function the same. Successfully cutting through the chains that appear on the screen will summon the Gay Blade, allowing Sora or Riku to cut through the obstacles blocking their path. Riku's Mirage Split is aptly named due to its use to cut through the illusions, or mirages, that appear before him. In the case of Walk of Delusions, which is my favorite use of this, each time the shift is used, the room gets progressively more confusing, only revealing a little more of it at a time. In its final use, the mirage is completely destroyed, revealing that this labyrinthine room was nothing more of a short hallway. Sora's Nightmare's End in the Avenue to Dreams has the opposite effect. It cuts through the buildings only to reveal a more confusing, overwhelming layout over time. Sora's areas are taller, wider, with more ways to move around to get where you need to go, but you often get turned around, and with the fog on the ground that makes you feel like you're being swept away, like waves coming down upon you, it's a great example of atmosphere and scale being used to make the player feel small, which is not something we were meant to feel since the back streets and mailroom of Traverse Town. This carries over into the oppressive design of the contorted city. Buildings move as if they're breathing, walls constantly pop up, blocking your way, and reality shifts are essentially forced on the player due to the buildings heading straight for you. But with the acquisition of Ars Arcanum, one of Sora's signature moves, and Salvation, one of Ven's light-based commands, and the upward spiral of the level design, the contorted city gives the sense that Sora is escaping the nightmare the organizations try to keep him in with all of his strength. However, this is a misdirection, as Sora is actually spiraling deeper into dreams, and despite his best efforts, will shortly be taken by young Xehanort to be the 13th vessel for the real Organization 13. That's nuts! In fact, both Sora and Riku's levels have them constantly moving upwards. Sora from the lowest point of the Dark City to the entrance of the castle that never was, and Riku from the lower areas of the castle to the top. As a little food for thought here, Riku's level being a twisted version of the castle that never was, I think might actually be Sora's doing. Since Riku is in Sora's dreams, and Sora is sleeping in the castle, these mirages may actually be Sora's heart's way of either protecting him or preventing him from waking. It's either the light in his dark preventing him from getting hurt, or it's the darkness attacking him like a virus. N no, not that one. Stopping anyone who gets close to his heart. Just thought I'd point that out. And just like with Sora's level, Riku's level also blends together level, gameplay, and narrative design. In the Delusive Beginnings area, due to the laser column illusion in the middle of the room, and if we're going by my theory that this is Sora's doing, this is probably a Xemnas influenced illusion, considering this man just loves his lasers. The player has to navigate to another room and drop down inside the column to dispel the illusion through Mirage Split. This then opens up a new way forward for the player a spiral ramp ascending upwards to the rest of the castle. And opening up the treasure chest next to the Dispelled Mirage grants the Double Flight ability, a move iconic to Aqua. Which is important to note, because we, the player, have to remember that this is supposed to be Sora and Riku's Mark of Master exam, 
and Riku gaining a move exclusive to Aqua when she was the only one to pass hers in Terra's exam makes a statement. We know who is passing this test before the game even ends. From here into the anti-Black Coat Nightmare fight, Riku is almost constantly moving upwards through the castle and dispelling illusions with the Gay Blade, cutting his way through the nightmare to Sora. Add Double Flight to the mix, which not only helps with movement but executing commands in a safe space, and what you get is a level that symbolizes Riku rising above the darkness that has plagued him for so long and gaining a level of mastery over his abilities that allow him to see through the dream and save Sora. It's a synergy of level, gameplay, and narrative design so elegant and so rarely seen in Kingdom Hearts games. Now, we know that this design for Riku's is not misleading the player as Sora's is because of a few more details. First, Sora's level is in the Dark City, which uses black and blue colors, which has been used throughout the series to represent darkness, while Riku's level is in the Castle, which uses grays and whites that while normally symbolize the nobodies, has also been used to show a mastery over light or light-based attacks. Now, Sora does get a light-based command, and Riku does get a dark-based command, Dark Splicer, which is a move that is very similar to Aqua's Time Splicer. However, unlike Salvation, this is not deceptive due to this chest actually being an area off the optimal path for story progression, so it's actually more of a bonus for exploring this area of the map. And, I mean, if we're going technically, so is Sora's Salvation, but this building that it's on is pretty smack dab central on the map, so it's actually it would be kind of hard for players to miss. The thing is, is that we see a lot of gameplay elements like this sprinkled throughout the game that foreshadows the big twist presented in the world that never was. Relating to Sora's fall to darkness is that Sora notably is using Shadow Breaker, an attack that uses both light and darkness. While Sora has been shown to channel and use the darkness before, it's either with Riku around or he has no control over it. So Sora being able to channel darkness on his own, even a little bit, is actually kind of jarring. Especially when there's Icebreaker, which channels fire and ice magic that many, myself included, thought would be the only one Sora would be able to use on a first playthrough. We've already touched upon Riku and Aqua sharing double flight, but looking closer at the shared abilities between Sora, Riku, and the Wayfinder trio yields some interesting results. Omitting all the abilities that date back to Chain of Memories or Kingdom Hearts 1, and omitting abilities that Riku and Sora have had in previous games, we see that Riku shares more abilities with Aqua than he does with Terra. And the ones shared with Aqua show a mastery over Riku's strength and magical abilities, and his moveset. In particular to the movement, which this game puts a huge emphasis on, Riku and Aqua shared abilities showcase a mastery through and control of the battle space, with Barrier and Counter Blast for the immediate space, and Dark Splicer, Time Splicer, Teleport, and Shadow Strike for distance. Most of Riku and Terra's shared abilities only emphasize strength and are not particularly iconic to Terra or Riku specifically, aside from the Darkness commands which are more iconic to Riku than to Terra. In Birth by Sleep anyway, these abilities shared by Riku and Terra were meant to draw parallels by giving Terra Riku's iconic moves. Dream Drop Distance merely continues those parallels, but not as strongly as it does with Riku and Aqua. In Sora's case, again omitting Calm and KH1 moves and pre-established moves of his, Sora unsurprisingly shares more commands with Ven than anyone else in the Wayfinder trio. In fact, other than Aerial Slam and Break Time, Sora doesn't share any moves with Terra or Aqua. Now, Sora's moveset is pretty established at this point in the series. He usually has fast-paced, flashy moves with some light attacks sprinkled in there. These shared abilities serve to parallel Sora and Ven even further. The only other command even remotely similar shared between Sora and another character is Ars Arcanum and Terra's Ars Solemn. Admittedly, this is a bit of a stretch, but like Terra, Sora is going to fail his Mark of Master exam due to Xehanort's influence, and like Ven, he's, he will fall asleep in the endgame. So Sora sharing abilities with Terra and Ven, but not Aqua, highlights the lack of mastery Sora exhibits. Mastery over strength, magic, or balance is debatable, but Sora has not shown a mastery over the balance of light and darkness in his heart, and that's what's important here. Sora's lack of shared abilities with Aqua foreshadows his failure of the test. And for one final foreshadowy tidbit, 
While the game does blatantly give Riku a Dream Eater sigil to mark his status as a Dream Eater, there are two other clues about this plot point throughout the game. The first is, is that Riku is awake when he and Sora unlock the first keyhole in Destiny Islands. The second is that Riku absorbs Dream Eaters to use command styles, being able to merge with them since he's also a Dream Eater. It was all there from the beginning, man! I hope what I've shown here today showcases the incredible detail of 3D's level and gameplay design, uh, regardless of what your opinion is on its execution in some areas. I could go on about how much I love the detail that went into 3D, and how that extends to Cage 3, but I'll save that for another video. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you all the next time I decide to rant about design foreshadowing, which is uh, apparently a thing I do now. Thank you all again for watching. Uh, this is a video that I've wanted to get out since basically right after Dream Drop Distance came out, and it only took me 10 years. Whoopsies. Um, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to stick around if you're watching this live to uh, watch the next video. And if you're watching this not live, uh, make sure to, to watch all these awesome videos in this March Caprice playlist. Um, I've, this has been an amazing event. I'm glad it's going into its second year. So yeah, make sure to check all those out.